okay, living as a man is difficult in some ways and easy in some ways, I think, relative to the other options on the table. And one of the ways in which I think it's difficult is that we have an inconsistent idea of what it means to be a man in the modern world. We have a traditional understanding, which is, of course, very patriarchal, very authoritarian, very, uh, you know, like, like strong, silent, keep your emotions in, that kind of stuff, you know. And then we have a more like modern interpretation of what it means to be a man, which is to deviate from those behaviors in some but not all ways. We still like it when men are big and strong, hegemonically, culturally, interpersonally. That is still a popular trait. Assertiveness is considered attractive, but assertiveness in the wrong way is considered creepy. A lot of guys fear being called creepy over stuff that I think a lot of mm -hmm. women get away with easily because people don't see a innate social threat with women's behavior, at least not often. And all of this together, I think, means that a lot of people are having a kind of crisis of identity. And there are not many roads out of this. You see the Manosphere Road, where it's like, um, you know, uh, a, a society hates you, feminism has ruined women, and, and, you know, the only way to overcome this is to focus on the grind, you know, focus on, don't care about women, make money, you know, whatever. Not a good idea, I think, for the mental health in the long run. And a lot of these people, you know, they're not going to make money just because you tell them to. This doesn't solve their problems. <laughs> But a lot of the lefties' attitudes towards this is like, a, well, you'll be more happy if you just check your privilege, reconcile the problematic aspects of your behavior, and, um, you know, sort of detoxify yourself, get rid of the toxic masculinity. This is incredibly patronizing, obviously. First of all, the introspection required to just take negative parts of your personality and twist them off this is an incredibly difficult task, even for people who have, like, that's like a lifelong thing. You know, we are both mm -hmm. the sculptor and the sculpture. It hurts to change yourself. Um, and it also doesn't immediately solve anyone's problems. Being less toxically masculine doesn't make you more confident, make you more happy with yourself. It maybe means you're less likely to lash out at yourself and others when certain conditions take place. But it's possible that for a lot of these guys, anger is actually a cathartic outlet. In which case, simply removing that actually creates more problems to their mm -hmm. mental health. It makes them feel like they have no outlet. The solution is synthesis. You have to find ways to promote positive masculinity, not just talk down the toxic elements. And the left struggles with this because I think a lot of them consider it beneath them to have to give instruction on how men ought to behave in a way that is actually useful. Mm. I think another part of the problem is, and and what I think you captured so well in in a bunch of series of tweets is like, you know, just the fact of reminding people that like the people that we're really talking about here are not like weird crypto fascists. They are essentially like 14, 15, 16 year olds who are seeing stuff on like TikTok. And I can't remember where, where it was you said it, but it's just like, these are not Bond villains. <laughs> these are just like, confused people with some bad ideas about what masculinity is and uh we can sort of counsel them through that right like why why the the invocation to like make them into this like dangerous straw man it's like that the teenager is standing in for all of the sins of patriarchy yeah and, and the average person who falls into this stuff is not even aware of the conditions that they're responding to or creating People mm -hmm. get into reactionary movements not because they want to be the domineering victors, but because they think they're victims. Look at the language behind literally every reactionary movement <laughs> ever, ever. Even when the, you know, to go as far as we can, the Nazis were at the apex of their power. You go to, you go listen to one there, the other speech and interspersed between the, you know, glory of the fatherland or whatever is crying and whinging about how they're victimized by international Judaism. They cannot, these reactionary movements, they cannot operate without the victim complex because the feeling of grievance is what drives them towards yeah. these perceived solutions. So, you know, the idea that these people are just like Machiavellians who are choosing to be sexist because they think they benefit from that power arrangement. No, they don't. They, mm. they, no, they don't. And also, comma, no, they do not. They don't benefit from it. Um, no more so than, than, you know, the white man benefits from white supremacy. He may be better off than the people he mistreats, but in fact, the life of many white people was made worse because the systems of slavery and labor exploitation, the institution of the police, which grew out of, you know, slave patrols, these institutions are recursive. They hurt people who are not just of a different race, but of lower stature, of lower power. And race is not the only power hierarchy in our society. There's also class. There's also health. There's mental health. 
there's a lot of stuff that intersects. People do not, in the long run, benefit from systems designed to hurt those other than them. Um, or, or, or perhaps maybe a very tiny minority of people on top. The population at large, certainly. Um, so I reject the idea that there is any Machiavellian self-interested intent here. I think people are sad and desperate and lonely. And being young people mostly, they're impressionable. And I think it's our responsibility to give them a narrative that contradicts the one that they seem to keep falling into. Mm. What exactly does that look like for a left? Like, how do we how do we sort of speak to these issues without like ceding any kind of ideological ground and, and sticking to the principles? Because we're not talking here about like abandoning feminism or anything like that. We're just talking about like speaking to a people before that they they go down the rabbit hole of like far right uh, manosphere bros. Oh, I, I the main thing I think you need is to teach confidence and self-reliance in ways that are actually positive. And the thing that's difficult about teaching confidence, you know, this is pickup artistry fundamentally. I have talked on stream before, oh, if you're at a party, you know, here are some ideas maybe on, on how you can approach these conversations. But the critical difference, you know, is that you don't want to foster the, the development of a kind of like checklist to run through. You, mm -hmm. you want to give people basic tools to, um, to, to respect the people they're talking to enough that they know when what they're doing is getting them social accolades, when, when, when they're doing something that is being received positively. And if you can get people to understand when that's happening, I think that's the bedrock upon which everything is built. Because I'll tell you, I don't know if you've ever struggled, struggled with like a lack of, of social confidence. I haven't, but I've heard from other people. Um, the <laughs> main thing that gets them is the idea they're in a social event, they're talking to somebody, and they feel like that other person just wants to leave the conversation. They're like inside, you know, they're talking about this, that, the other, and inside they're thinking, oh God, they just want me to stop talking. You become apologetic. You sort of stutter in your speech because you're like sort of pausing for their signal. You're, 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 you're sabotaging yourself because mm -hmm. you're not putting your best foot forward now. You're waiting for them to take a step away. And in doing so, you're giving them an excuse to. It's not good. And teaching people like how to move from that, how to be better than that, I think that's, literally like step one a lot of these guys in the manosphere can't even talk to women they're terrified of them <laughs> that is so true that is so true uh, i wanted to ask you a little bit i don't know if this is exactly pushing back but one of the one of the questions i had in seeing some of your takes is like can this be veering a little too far into left bashing and i say that because in this episode uh, that i'm producing we also are talking to folks with cute on anonymous who are doing this series on the man clan and i talked to annie kelly and i sort of said you know, what should the left do? And she's like, yeah, that's all a good point. But actually, I think maybe the left is like, I mean, the right is talking um, to these people, but like the left is too, right? Like this, the liberal center is like completely ignoring this and, you know, wanting to deplatform it. And that's the extent of it. But she said like, you know, when she was doing her PhD, talking to all these like far right manosphere people, um, every time she ran into somebody who had left the movement, they were essentially a socialist. And they had a story about someone uh, on the left talking to them. And so she came to the conclusion, I actually think we are actually doing a little bit, maybe not enough, but but we're doing stuff. I don't think there's a total absence uh, from the left in, in terms of responding to it. I think that there are, there are two points to this. Um, I think one of them is that there is on the left, an assumption that the only way to get these guys out of the position that they're in is to move them over to another radical ideology to fill the same hole in their chest that the Manosphere stuff did. Mm -hmm. Socialism is a wonderful thing. I believe in it. Um, but I know a lot of people use radical ideologies as a way of giving themselves a drive and a purpose to distinguish themselves from others, to give them a sense of identity. This isn't necessarily bad, but it's also not the same as fixing the initial problems. It's just giving them right. a different set of tools to cope with them. I think that this is useful in tandem with other things. I think personally that people will gravitate towards positive ideologies if they start with a healthy mindset. If on a, on a fundamental level, you know, you, you give them the tools to engage appropriately with their social setting, I think they're more likely to make those positive decisions. They're less likely to fall down the bad rabbit holes. And I'm interested in seeing, because you take a 14-year-old white boy on a playground, right? Terrified of women, a lot of them, right? Like, this is the thing, you know, puberty. Um, but now we're all listening to, you know, internet self-help coaches. I mean, people are more susceptible than ever to extremely well-produced propaganda. 
selling them ideologies based on this, that, the other. And I notice a lot of young people who get into socialism and do it out of a kind of contrarianism, whatever, right. we all start somewhere. But that's not the reason why people get into the Manosphere stuff. It's not to be contrarian. It's because there's a deep underlying anxiety about them and their relationship with women. And I think that specifically needs to be targeted, not just through here's another thing that can give your life meaning, but through these ideas should be, um, at, at the face of it, they should be ridiculous. Just mm. To you, you should see this and you should think, this does not work for me. This is a ridiculous set of solutions because I have this. And the this I want them to have is confidence, is social skills. That's interesting. So if I hear you correctly, like we should be starting like basically just at the level of like pro-social uh, self-help, essentially, like how to just navigate as a as a young person who's a bit socially awkward and can't quite fit in uh, and not like the level of sort of structural explanation, right? Because you could construct a kind of socialist answer to this, which I tend to do. It's like, okay, you're you're feeling this kind of economic anxiety and dislocation because this sort of male breadwinner role that used to exist no longer is an option for you. And we're just trying to reckon with that kind of wreckage. Um, so you can kind of point to structure, whereas you're saying point to like just the, like, can they navigate their social world? Yeah, it's, I don't think a person should need to have like a, a um, you know, like a socialist critical theory of, perspective on their own anxieties in order to overcome mm. and alleviate them. A lot of young people aren't going to become radicals. And I think that's fine, you know, as long as they don't go down the the worst roads they could possibly take. Ideally, you would hit them with both. But there are right. a lot, and I, you know, I don't mean to besmirch here, but there are a lot of people on the left who are kind of miserable because <laughs> as it turns out, having good politics has nothing to do with living a fulfilling life. They're actually completely separate things. There are neo-Nazis who live fulfilling lives. Not many, I'll admit, those people generally are doing pretty poorly. Um, and there are communists and socialists uh, who are living terrible lives because politically they're on the ball, but that doesn't give them the skills right. to talk to people or to, to order their lives in an appropriate way. Jordan <laughs> Peterson got famous, right? I mean, with his self-help stuff, which was laden, of course, with conservative propaganda, but at its face, it was about self-help and understanding from a critical perspective, why you feel the way you do is not the same as not feeling that way. I think it's better to, to say to this person, you know, here's how you alleviate your anxiety than mm. to say, this is why you're feeling that way. Not only because most people aren't just, just aren't that introspective to begin with. It takes time, I think, in education for many to, to get to that point, but also because that feeling is the core of their, their response, not their right. lack of an understanding of it. Hmm. I, I see your point. I think one of the, one of the tensions, this has come came up for me every single time I, I talk to other lefties about self-help, the kind of stock answer is that I'm not really sure there's a way to do it in a pro-social way because it has like an individuating aspect where like even in this conversation, we're talking about like people and their inner world and how they like learn to navigate as individuals um, on the playground or whatever. And I worry like, is there a tension there? Are we actually, if, if we don't, uh, forefront, maybe not forefront, but at least include very quickly that kind of structural uh, answer. We end up with like a new kind of just like lefty-ish Jordan Peterson, but it's still a you know a, a manual. It's just twelve different rules. Well, you, I think you get a kind of political doomerism where people mm -hmm. are you know they have an ideology that I might agree with, but their attitude towards it is one of a kind of defeatist. The world is bad because of these reasons, and I am just sort of sleepwalking through it. I mean, we saw a lot of that back during the 2020 election, I think, especially after Bernie dropped out, where a lot of people's adherence to leftism seems to be an abstract, like, sit from the sidelines, you know, crow when things are going poorly and cheer when they're going well, but it doesn't seem to order their lives very much. And I disagree with the idea that self-help is very individualized. Um, mm. I actually think this is a really negative leftist tendency, or progressive tendency, maybe, or maybe it's just a tendency. The idea that, um, well, different things work differently for everyone. That's not true. There are a lot of things that work perfectly well for everyone, and most people don't do it. Exercise, properly regulating their diet and sleep schedule, um, making sure they go outside and get some vitamin D, doing their best to go to in real life, in-person social events and speak occasionally with people 
uh, in a mm -hmm. non-customer service setting. These are objective bits of advice. There are very few exceptions to them. And most people don't do them. It's like, the, yeah. it's, this is why like talking with doctors is frustrating, right? You go to a doctor and you talk with them about your sleep issues and the doctor will be like, okay, what's your sleep schedule? And you'll be like, what, my what, my what? And then it's like, well, they can't help you with any kind of medicine if there might be like 17 basic physiological things you're messing <laughs> up. Do you do any exercise? What? Do you go outside? What? Like, so I, I think that basic lessons on confidence, social engagement for young men, I think have almost universal applicability. Obviously, there are some cases where there's some like much deeper specific thing. But man, if you could target, you know, 90% of people with a given social anxiety, I, I'd say that's a pretty huge portion if the Manosphere is turning out millions of supporters.